just wanted to give you a really brief um, introduction, I guess, to how we came to set up Montezuma's, um, because it was a slightly odd journey, and people ask me all the time, so were you, were you in chocolate? Uh, and I just say, no, I knew nothing about it, apart from how to eat it. Uh, so on a January day, nearly 20 years ago, I walked into my office where I worked as a trainee solicitor, and I was told by my supervising partner that I was... Uh, that there was a new trainee starting that day and I was to be his mentor. So later that day I was introduced to Simon, a smiley, bold and adventurous young man who had put on uh, hold his legal career for a few years while he travelled the world. Uh, as with everything I uh, took on as a, a lawyer in training, I wanted to take my mentoring responsibility seriously. Six weeks later, Simon and I were engaged to be married. <laughs> Uh, it didn't take us long to realise that neither of us was going to be very happy as a lawyer for the rest of our lives. Um, so almost as soon as we qualified, we gave up our jobs and sold our house, put everything into storage and went off in search of ourselves. It was a very cliched year off and um, we found ourselves on a plane to Buenos Aires where we travelled the length and breadth of Argentina, Chile, Venezuela, Ecuador uh, and had an amazing time. We'd we took ridiculously long bus journeys. We sailed in the Beagle Channel. We took a, we took a boat uh, over the Iguazu Falls. Ridiculous. Uh, and we trekked for days in Patagonia, which was just the most incredible experience. It was obvious we were having the time of our lives, but we couldn't carry on doing that. We had to find something to do, think of what we wanted to do when we came home. Uh, so on a, on a trip to the Argentinian Lake District, um, we stopped in a beautiful little town called uh, San Carlos de Bariloche. But Simon, unfortunately, had a touch of tummy trouble, shall we say. Uh, so rarely uh, we booked ourselves into a little guest house uh, where he could stay close to the loo and recover. So I found myself at a bit of a loose end where I... So I just thought, well, I don't want to go too far. So I, I was... Um, I spent about three days wandering around this little town called Bariloche, and I discovered to my delight that it was filled with chocolate shops. Uh, more chocolate shops than I'd ever seen in one town in my life. And I just, so I spent most of my time sampling the local specialities while poor Simon was stuck in the bathroom. I checked on him occasionally, but on finding that he was no better, I went back out to sample a little bit more. <coughs> this, the smell of chocolate actually... Uh, wafted down the street it was incredible and the retail theater was amazing it, they were making chocolate in these ti some tiny shops there was even a chocolate supermarket uh, and it hit me what was this town in the middle of argentina how could it sustain so many chocolate shops when the offering back in the uk was so poor at the time this was 1999 don't forget uh, i was already passionate about chocolate was it possible that we could actually make a business out of it uh, so from that moment on, I became a bit obsessed by chocolate. Um, it's not hard, is it? Um, and how, how we could make a living out of it. Uh, a couple of months later, we were in Venezuela, and we were diligently following our Lonely Planet uh, guidebook and had read about this amazing remote beach. Uh, we were desperately trying to find this beach, and we'd had to take a car to get there. So we were driving this battered old uh, 19... 90 Datsun or something, um, driving it through this mountainside forest and uh, went round a corner and there was a little roadblock in the way. We, could, we couldn't go any further. So we jumped out and thought, what on earth is going on? This is bizarre. There were lots and lots of um, local people just sort of sitting by the roadside doing very little. And we thought, this is ridiculous. We want to get to this beach. And actually, we discovered that they were local farmers and they were drying their cocoa beans on the hot roads. So the only place for them to dry their beans was on, on the hot tarmac. It was a very basic tarmac road, but that was, it was hot enough that it would dry the beans. And we later discovered that that is an essential part of cocoa farming. So we couldn't go any further. We stayed for a while and learned a huge amount about where chocolate comes from. And that was it. I was hooked. I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't get this whole idea of chocolate out of my head. Uh, so we, we found the beach eventually, um, and it was amazing. But shortly afterwards, we'd hopped over to Tobago, and we were um, trekking with our full packs on, by which point, we were about seven months into our journey by this point, uh, our packs were incredibly heavy. And Simon picked up his pack and screamed in agony, dropping his pack to the ground. Um, 
less than 48 hours later, we were back in London and Simon was in hospital with a slip disc. <laughs> not very, uh, not quite as dramatic as a snake bite or a tropical disease, but nevertheless, it was enough to put our travelling on hold for a while. And Simon wasn't looking like a great travelling companion at this point either. Um, so I set about researching the chocolate industry. I thought, I've got all this time. Simon is in hospital. Uh, we're staying with the in I'm staying with his parents, so I'm living with, his, uh, with my in-laws, and I'm desperate to escape the house. So I set about researching the chocolate industry. I come here, and I um, find Mintel research reports and read up all I can about the chocolate industry to just desperately try and work out whether there is a gap in the British chocolate market. Um, I started to write a business plan, and gradually the plans for Montezuma's was born. <coughs> Excuse me. We, it was very much a retail idea. We were planning on having 50 shops all over the country, uh, but we had no plans to make chocolate ourselves. We, we weren't interested. We were interested in having a retail brand, effectively. So, but we had lots of ideas for fantastic quality chocolate products um, to be fat, you know, sort of inspired by our travels and all packaged up in contemporary quirky designs. Um, so I spent days trawling high streets around the country trying to, uh, uh, trying to find stores, um, our first shop. I wrote hundreds of letters to landlords and tenants begging them to give us a lease on their, sh on their shop. Uh, and we went around the country finding some British chocolate makers who were going to make all of our products for us. Um, finally, one of my letters to a landlord worked, and a guy in Brighton agreed to let us his shop. <coughs> we signed our first lease for our shop in Brighton, and that was, we were ecstatic. That was such a great, that was like signing the deal. We were, we were in business. Um, so well, obviously, there was masses to do, and we really needed to get our products, our chocolate, into production at this point. So we set about phoning all, phoning all the chocolate makers who we'd found. Um, but there was one who was to make more than half of our range, and we just couldn't get hold of them on the phone. So after a couple of days of trying, we jumped in the car and drove to Kent, where, they were, where we'd met them before, in their factory. And we arrived to find a notice of liquidation on their front door. And they'd gone bust in the few weeks that we hadn't spoken to them. So we, were, we went to bed that night with a a lease to our name, hundreds of thousands of pounds committed to, uh, to this lease over the next 16 years, and very few products to put in it. Um, by the morning, we'd both, we both woke up and said, we're going to have to make it ourselves, that's it. There is, no op there is no alternative. We knew there was no alternative. Um, but we had to learn how to make chocolate, and fast. We were due to open in a few weeks' time. On 12th of August 2000, nearly a year to the day that we came back from South America, we opened the doors in Brighton to Montezuma's Chocolate, innovative British chocolate. <coughs> I could barely watch as the customers came and they spent money on stuff that we'd created. We took £600 in our first day, which was a miracle to us. That turned into £200,000 in our first year, which um, meant that we'd broken even, which is what everybody had told us we wouldn't do. Uh, so it was, you know, we were so happy about that. Um, but we were working 24-7. Um, if you started up your own businesses already, you'll know that that is, that is a reality. We were making chocolate by night and then selling it by day. But it was an incredible time. It was fueled by a complete passion for what we, for what we were doing and creating. We absolutely loved it. Uh, the business grew and changed direction. <clears throat> and manufacturing definitely took over. Um, and we started to sell to some big retailers, uh, and our little empire was growing. And we now, um, we now produce 250 products. We have an ever-expanding factory, and we often make in a couple of days what we sold in our, the equivalent to what we sold in our first year. Uh, we have six retail stores, so our plans for 50 didn't quite materialize because the business just changed direction and we went in on a different course. But we also export to more than 30 countries worldwide, um, and... You know, we are, our focus is creating a, a, a family, sustainable business, um, still producing premium chocolate in 50 years' time. Thank you. Thank you, Helen.
Yeah, thank you, Helen. Just a couple of questions from me. I mean, chocolate's so exciting, and I'm going to mention intellectual property, which sounds so dull and boring. But what role has intellectual property played in your business journey? Um, well, and it, yeah, I suppose an interesting one. It's, I mean, it's, it's useful. Our training as lawyers was useful. Um, because I certainly knew, I didn't know, I certainly don't know everything about intellectual property, but I knew how to find out the answers if I needed help. Um, so, there, you know, there was the more boring stuff about registering trademarks, so all of our logos are registered trademarks, but we have 250 different products. We can't register a trademark for every single one. So we do, we are, we do take a risk that somebody will copy them, um, but then we rely on other intellectual property rights. Um, but we did have an interesting letter once from a very large um, chocolate uh, company whose um, who's main product is purple. <laughs> um, and we, one year, my, our designer persuaded us to, she created a, a range of Christmas products which were in a very purple design. That's my least favorite color, but it was purple nevertheless. And literally within a day of it hitting our shelves, we had a letter on our, on our doorstep from um, Mr. Cabri. Uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> Very, very strongly worded letter. We had to destroy, we didn't, but we insisting that we removed all of our products from the shelves and that we destroyed them. Um, of course, uh, we read the letter, panicked slightly, um, and then thought, actually, hang on a minute, that can't be right. We can't possibly not produce any chocolate products in purple. That can't be right. So we did our research. We fortunately knew how to do this and searched the IP registers and and actually, no, Cadbury have a protection over one shade of purple, which is a Pantone reference. Um, and we were able to go back with that information with a very strongly worded, you know, kind of David and Goliath sort of message back to them. And they relented. So that was, yeah. Well, well done to you, because that's quite an amazing <laughs> success story. But it does just show you, doesn't it, as a small business, you can be really intimidated by yes, the bigger companies. Yeah. But I know the business and IP centre, the IP is a clue in the title. Mm. So again, if you need any information on intellectual property, then go and check out the BIPC. Mm. The other thing you mentioned about you wanted potentially to have 50 stores, but in fact, I've got six. But this day and age of omnipresent yeah. retail, cross borders, obviously you've done incredibly well, 30 international markets. So I'd imagine the retail scene has changed dramatically yeah. for you when you first set out. Is it easier now, do you think, to retail your goods than when you first started out, to reach out to more markets? Um, I'm not sure. I think when we started, we just didn't consider that we would sell into other retailers. So when we started, it was all about creating that retail presence of our own on the high street, and that was why we had the plan for 50 stores. Um, as we progressed, we realised that actually retail is really tough and has become tougher and tougher and tougher, I would say, today. Um, and selling into other retailers is actually a far less risky route to market. Um, plus which, because we were manufacturing, we had that margin there that meant that we could sell into other retailers. And also it meant that we could sell overseas. And, and actually, we were very fortunate. The interest almost came to us. So, you know, kind of overseas buyers were coming to us saying, oh, we really like these products. Um, can we sell them? And then it was all about trying to actually work out how to get them there. And I know, obviously, the, the core of it, just the final question before I move on to the next speaker, is the ethical side of it and the fact that it is produced by you that you're not sub yeah. subcontracting it out. So how important is that story? Because you told a story tonight <laughs> of the journey. How, how much do people actually buy into that when they're taking um, your brand? I, mm, it's easy to kind of assume what people think. Um, I think a lot of consumers don't really think about it, but I think for the ones that do, it is really important mm. that they understand the backstory behind where this product comes from actually what it means, especially with chocolate, often cocoa hits the press because it's badly farmed mm. um, and has a lot of, you know, kind of child labour and slavery kind of accusations thrown at it. So for us, it's really important that we, we understand where our cocoa comes from and who's farming it and how well it's farmed and the quality of it. And that's a huge part of what we do is trying to ensure that that is a, you know, a, a well, a, a good process. So that's yeah, and that ethical, the fair yeah. trading is incredibly important. Yeah. Well, Helen, I know I'm sure the audience will have plenty more questions later on. And that box of chocolates has been travelling around with you over the weekend. <laughs> yeah. It's still intact. It is, and one lucky person will be able to win that today. <laughs> so, Helen Patterson, everybody. Thank you, Helen. Thank you.